partisan tensions raging in Washington with impeachment hearings, but what are the issues and policies driving the Iowa electorate ahead of 2020? We sit down with a pair of Iowa online political writers, Laura Bellin and Shane Vandehart, on this edition of Iowa Press. Funding for Iowa Press was provided by Friends, the Iowa Public Television Foundation, the Associated General Contractors of Iowa, the public's partner in building Iowa's highway, bridge, and municipal utility infrastructure. I'm a dad. I am a mom. I'm a kid. I'm a kid at heart. I'm a banker. I'm an Iowa banker. No matter who you are, there is an Iowa banker who is ready to help you get where you want to go. Iowa Bankers, allowing you to discover the genuine difference of Iowa banks. For decades, Iowa Press has brought you politicians and newsmakers from across Iowa and beyond, celebrating nearly 50 years of broadcast excellence on statewide Iowa public television. This is the Friday, November 22 edition of Iowa Press. Here is David Yepsen. Political partisanship is hard to avoid in today's media climate. As impeachment hearings move into their third week in Washington, the 2020 campaign is wrapping up nearly a year of Democrats working Iowa. But what candidates are primed for success next year? Well, we've gathered a pair of online political writers plugged into their respective readerships. Laura Bellin is editor of the progressive website Bleeding Heartland, and Shane Vanderhart is editor of the conservative Christian website Caffeinated Thoughts. Laura, Shane, welcome to the show. Good Thank to have you. you with us. Thanks for having us. Across the table, journalists joining us are David Pitt with the Associated Press and Aaron Murphy, Des Moines Bureau Chief for Lee Enterprises. So, Shane, we wanted to ask you, th this past week, uh, Iowans had a service for Chief, I, uh, former Supreme Court Chief Justice Mark Cady, who passed mm -hmm. away uh, about a week ago. Um, Cady will be perhaps most well known for writing a decision the in the Varnum Ryan case that legalized same-sex marriage in Iowa. Um, that decision sparked a movement to, uh, among conservatives, particularly evangelical conservatives, that uh, had some of the justices removed off the Supreme Court. And since then, Republicans have also um, changed the state law that determines how um, the justices to the Supreme Court are picked in Iowa, mm -hmm. gave a little more authority to the governor. I, I'm, I'm wondering, from your perspective, uh, are conservatives happier now with the direction of, of the court system in Iowa since the Varnum decision? Well, I, I think they're, they're definitely happy with the, the change in the makeup of the, of the uh, uh, judicial nomination committee process um, uh, and, and the fact that um, it's a little more transparent and uh, I think the governor is able to get a little, uh, has a little more, um, a few more options, uh, options that would be probably, uh, I would say, um, ones that she would probably be more interested in, in nominating the court. One of the things prior to the change that a lot of people didn't understand, I, you know, one thing, one thing that I heard constantly was that. Um, the nomination process it's, it's totally nonpartisan it's nonpartisan but you know conservatives as we viewed the process we said well it seemed to us to be stacked in in progressives favor with with uh, the requirement that so many you know members of the bar be on the on the, um, the commissions and and so forth so we just didn't feel like you know when the governor got their you know, when Ransug had his picks and when Reynolds had her picks that uh, you know, probably they weren't getting the candidates that they would, you know, really like to have. That's, it's just Laura? a complete canard. I mean, most of the elected attorneys on judicial nominating commissions in Iowa are Republicans. They have been Republicans. The uh, Governor Branstad, when he was able to fill those three vacancies on the Iowa Supreme Court in 2011, after the ouster of the three Supreme Court justices, he was sent a list with many conservative candidates. He appointed three conservatives in 2011, and this was a state judicial nominating commission that had been most filled with Vilsack and Culver appointees. So I understand that that's a grievance that Republicans have expressed, but it's just not borne out by any facts at all about the Iowa judiciary. What do you expect to see, Laura, uh, to happen as a result of uh, Chief Justice Katie's passage? 
Well, I think it's unfortunate that it, it, all of the, the changes are unfortunate because I think Republicans in the legislature and the governor are very happy with the idea of giving the governor more of a free hand in judicial appointments. But people who haven't been born yet are going to be governor under this system at, decades from now. And we have no idea whether they will be wise and use that power to appoint good qualified people or whether they'll just put cronies on the commission and on the court. Well, well and to that point, is this um, something that Democrats have at least waking up to uh, that uh, you know Republicans got into power and, and made these changes uh, are, are Democrats at least aware of the game that's being played now for lack of a better way to put it to you know that they need to win races so they can be in a position to either you know stop a, a change like this or or have the governorship and 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 have that authority uh, in their power well Democrats had a trifecta in Iowa from 2007 to 2010 and nobody even raised this issue of changing judicial nominating at the time I know that Governor Culver wasn't always happy with the candidates that were forwarded to him to make the appointments, but that's the way the system works. It was a good system that was working well since 1962. So I just think it's very unfortunate that it has become politicized in Shane, this way. But you expect the court to move further to the right. I, yeah, I, I, I think I think change. we're we're seeing that shift. I, I don't know how much that looks like. I, you know, um, Laura mentioned that you know it was full of Republicans. I, I would say not, maybe maybe there were Republicans, but not necessarily conservative. Not necessarily. Right. Uh, people who were originalist in their in their view of their judicial philosophy, uh, so I, I think we're seeing more of a shift in that regard. It'll be interesting to see what kind of changes that will make yeah. with mm -hmm. upcoming decisions. Different kind of Republican. Yeah, yeah. they probably should switch topics because we could do a whole show. <laughs> no doubt. Um, so the impeachment obviously is the uh, the other thing that's in the news now uh, quite a bit, and I'd just like to get your sense for whether it's firing up the base, and maybe you can both answer this question. Where 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 are we with that? Is it changing any minds? Um, maybe Shane, you can take that first. And it's not changing anybody's mm -hmm. minds. Uh, there might be a small number, but among Republicans, they're fired up. I mean. Uh, you know, you look at Donald Trump and his uh, his his approve his uh, favorability among Republicans is higher than even you know Kim Reynolds. So, uh, I, I think I, I think the base is fired up. I think they're tired of uh, you know uh, the impeachment hearings. Um, I, I've personally tried to to look at it with an open mind, and and you know I'm more you know I'm a little more interested in firsthand testimony than those that are just building a narrative, but. I, I don't see really anybody's mm -hmm. minds changed. If you if you went into it thinking he should be impeached, that's what how you're leaving. And if you and, and leave. Laura, what do you think? What's it doing to the Democratic base? The Anything? twenty the 2020 election will be a referendum on Donald Trump. That's we, what we've seen. The 2018 election was essentially a referendum on Donald Trump, and I don't think impeachment changes that either way. I think what all signs point to a very high turnout election with high base turnout on both sides. I think the big question is the independents, the swing voters. I think there will be high turnout, and I think the, the, the jury's out on how impeachment will affect those voters. But generally speaking, with or without impeachment, whether articles are voted out, whatever the Senate does, the next November's election is going to be a referendum on Trump. So does it help uh, President Trump because it fires up the Republican base? <laughs> well, I, I wouldn't say necessarily it helps, but uh, it, I don't think it, yeah, yeah, maybe a little bit with the Republican base, but it, the question is what does it do to independents? Aaron. So we want to talk about the uh, Democratic primary, the caucuses, but maybe as a nice segue between those two, Laura, I'll ask you real quick first, if this does go to the Senate and, and there's been talk about if that lasts a long time, that pulls some of these candidates off the trail here, Elizabeth Warren, mm -hmm. uh, Bernie Sanders, uh, and, and others, Amy Klobuchar. Does that have a real impact on, on that primary here in Iowa, at least, if that happens? I think it could, absolutely. And we have an unprecedented race in Iowa now. We have never had four candidates grouped together polling around 20 percent give or take a few we we've just never had a race that competitive we've had lower polling candidates make a late surge but we've just and we've had some front runners that weren't as dominant but so i think it's it will be very competitive we saw in 2004 and 2008 more than half of the democratic caucus goers made up their mind in the final month so those last few weeks of campaigning will be crucial and it will probably be volatile and if several of the key candidates are tied up in washington on an impeachment trial it could definitely have an effect so it gives you real quick kind of 35,000 vote Foot view of this race right now. That aside, um, how do you see that? You mentioned the the kind of the 
top four polling leaders. How do you see this race? I think it's anybody's game. I think it is wide open. I've always I've been bearish on Joe Biden because for a front runner, his numbers have been very weak in Iowa all year. And generally speaking, Dan Guild, who's an analyst and a, a historian of the Iowa caucuses, I think you could say he's looked at decades of polling and a front runner who starts the race below 30 percent basically doesn't win the Iowa caucuses. So but I, I think anybody could could do very well. And I think the problem for the lower polling candidates is that the top of the field is very well liked. And so we see the, the people who are uh, right now stuck in the single digits, uh, Kamala Harris and Amy Klobuchar and Cory Booker, you know, they're hoping and hoping. But right now, you know, there's not really a niche for them to fill that none of the that the top tier candidates aren't filling. So Shane, we'd be really interested in hearing do you have someone you're afraid of on the Democratic side? Is there somebody you would prefer to see run against the president? Well, just, you know, just to be clear, I'm actually registered independent, and okay. I didn't vote for Trump in 2016. So, uh, so there's nobody I'm afraid of. Uh, <laughs> well, if I'm afraid of a candidate, it's for probably opposite reasons. You know, if they got elected, I, oh, wow. Um, but, no, I, I think Biden's probably the, still yet the strongest candidate to run against President Trump. I, I think that... Uh, um, uh, independents would probably see him as, as a better choice than some of the, some of the candidates that are tacking further to the left. Uh, so he he's probably the one I think would be most competitive. If Joe Biden, Laura, if Joe Biden falters, who takes the center lane? I think it's really hard to say. I think there are a number of candidates fine for that. But I think the bigger question is if Joe Biden falters, who beats him in the South and particularly among African-American voters? Because that's who decides Democratic presidential nominations. And right now, I, I don't really see Elizabeth Warren or Bernie Sanders and certainly not Pete Buttigieg as well positioned to beat Biden in the South. I mean, Kamala Harris and Cory Booker were the candidates who could have put together that Obama coalition and whether they will do well enough in Iowa to put them in position to do well in the South is an open question. Is Amy Klobuchar showing any momentum? I think she's got a little bit of momentum. I think it's just she had a, a strong debate. No, I think that there are people, if, if Biden starts to look really non-viable as a candidate, I think someone like Amy Klobuchar could gain. But there are a number of candidates who are, are vying for that position, and Pete Buttigieg, I think, most explicitly by saying he's for Medicare for all who want it. Mm -hmm. So, but again, I, I just think that most Iowa Democrats are not firmly committed to a candidate, and they will make up their mind in late December or January. Yeah, I, I mean, I saw 62 percent uh, in the latest register poll say they could change their mind. So that's pretty interesting. They only dropped one percent from October. So. <laughs> How about Elizabeth Warren? Is she too liberal a candidate to win a general election, Laura? Do you think? I don't know. I don't, don't think we know yet. I mean, she used to be a Republican, and if you've seen her in person, she does very well with an audience, and she's nothing like the caricature that uh, sometimes you see on television. So I think that we we really don't know. She's speaking to a lot of issues that matter to people. And I, I think that that'll be something that she has to continue to demonstrate throughout the primaries, that, that she is a candidate who can win. But right now, I mean, if you look at national polls, most of the candidates are beating Donald Trump or do, are very competitive with Donald mm -hmm. Trump. And you mentioned Mayor Pete. Is that surge? Is that real? Is that a, 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 a long-term trend or is that a you know, a Ben Carson or, or Howard Dean type moment that's going to have the other side of the bell curve? Well, he's had a couple of surges in Iowa. He had the surge in the spring that put him in position to be like in the teens, and then he had this other surge. It's to his tremendous credit that he's positioned himself to get to being a top-tier candidate. But it's very hard to say right now whether he's going to end up like a Howard Dean who peaked too soon or whether he'll be like a John Kerry who continued to gain yeah. support. Yeah, what's your observation? I, I think uh, uh, Mayor Pete has, has a black voter problem. I think, you know, we're seeing a surge in Iowa if he wins Iowa, even if he wins New Hampshire. And... Of course, you had that poll that came out that, that, you know, he's now 10 points ahead. But I think that comes to a screeching halt when he gets hit South Carolina. Lee's poll had him at less than 1% of the black voters supporting him. Uh, do you want to move on to the federal court question? Okay, so we talked about state courts. I guess the federal courts have been a big issue. Maybe, Shane, I could address this to you first. Um, what, what's, the, what's the impact? I mean, we've, we've seen a lot of federal judges being appointed. Right. Uh, there's obviously an interest in another Supreme Court, per, perhaps, pick for the, for the president. Yeah. Uh, where does that uh, align with all, with all of this? Well, that's, that's probably one of the areas where I've been the, the happiest with, with President Trump, and I think most conservatives, conservatives have been happy with his judicial picks. There's been a couple that... You know, we, I think a few of us have soured on, but for the most part, you know, his legacy will be how he's 
how he's changed the court, and I think it's, you know, we're going to see that, you know, for years to come. I mean, he's made a lot of good picks. He's had a lot of picks. Uh, he's flipped a couple of circuit uh, courts, so it'll be interesting to see. I uh, yeah. want to talk a little bit about looking ahead to 2020 as well in the general election. Um, Shane, in particular, wanted to ask you, um, Iowa was a state that the president won by almost 10 points um, in 2016. How safe is he here? And, and in particular, do these agricultural issues at some point, uh, haven't seen it yet, but does at some point the, those issues start to hurt his support here? Yeah, I'd say it, I, I wouldn't necessarily put it this in Iowa's safe territory, but I'd say it, it leans Trump. So, um, and I, I think definitely if, if there is some peel off, you'll see it in the suburbs and you'll see it maybe along Lawrence. some, some uh, rural voters. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. I think I would agree that Iowa probably leans to Trump, but we're expecting a much higher turnout election in 2020. It could be 10 or 15 percent even higher than the turnout in 2016. And so that's where it's really hard to say whether I do think the Republican base will be motivated, but it could be that there is a, a surge of voters who didn't participate in 2016 who have soured on Trump. So I definitely wouldn't say it's safe for Trump. Well, is, is, um, is it possible, though, that the, that new surge of voters is going to be blue-collar voters who haven't participated in past elections, low motivation that are going to turn out for Trump? I think it's going to be all kinds of people. But what we saw in 2018, and we saw it recently in elections in Kentucky, Louisiana, Virginia, that there's a large number of voters who are hostile to Trump who are inspired to participate. Mm -hmm. So we'll have another big race here in Iowa for the Senate seat uh, with U.S. Senator Joni Ernst. Uh, if we want to get both of you guys' thoughts on, on that race, starting with you, Shane. Um, do you feel, uh, Senator, Senator Ernst said recently she's one of the more vulnerable senators up for election. Do, do you agree with that? Oh, you, you, you can't deny that. I mean, her, her approval rating is one of the you know, lowest uh, among um, uh, senators as far as she saw a nine-point you know, point drop. So I, I, you know, I, I would definitely be concerned if I were her. I, I don't think this is going to be an easy race. Um, I think a lot depends on who Democrats will nominate. I think uh, Teresa Greenfield is probably, you know, the, will be the strongest candidate to run against her. But um, so, yeah, they can't, they can't uh, obviously sit back and relax. They have to really work hard. Right. I, I think she can make a good case for that, but it, it's not going to be an easy race. Jade, why? That's her num uh, her well, that's a good question. I, uh, I, I think uh, perhaps, you know, uh, uh, the RFS thing might be hurting renewable her among fuel some, standards. Yeah, renewable fuel standard might be hurting her among some rural voters. I, I, um, I, I think there might be some dissatisfaction that she's not pushing back against Trump as much. I wanted to ask you about that. How, how, how much does Trump on the ticket with her help or hurt? Well, mm -hmm. I, again, he's got a higher approval rating than she mm -hmm. does, so it's that's gonna that's hard to say. Um, he didn't really have much coattails in 2016, so I, I I'm not anticipating he's it, that's going to happen in 2020 either. So, Laura, maybe we could talk about uh, Teresa Greenfield in that race. Uh, and, and talk to us a little bit about where you think that stands. She's obviously the choice of the Democratic uh, national, um, you know, folks and in, in funding coming that her way from there. What do you think? Uh, I think it's that? very open. Yeah. I think most Democratic voters don't know a lot about the candidates for Senate. I thought it was unfortunate at the recent at this Liberty and Justice celebration where we had 14,000 mm -hmm. people there and they didn't give the Senate candidates a chance to speak. So I think Teresa Greenfield, you have to say that she's the front runner in the primary with the support that she has in the fundraising. But I think that people are going to be very open to hearing from the other candidates. I think uh, Kimberly Graham, who is running on like the Bernie Sanders, AOC type platform. There are a lot of Iowa Democrats who believe in those issues. I think Michael Franken has a very interesting biography. He's the only candidate not from Polk County. He's a veteran. He's from a farming family. So if, if he's able to get his message out to people, I think I think the primary is fairly open. And I think mm. it's healthy for the Democrats to have a vigorous primary. I don't, I don't think it helped us in 2014 that everybody coalesced around one candidate for the Senate race. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, we also wanted to talk about the 4th District congressional race. Uh, there's a primary there mm -hmm. as well on the Republican side. Shane, um, what's your view? Is, is Steve King vulnerable in that pr in that primary specifically for, I, before we get to the general? My sense is that he still has a lot of grassroots support. I think the primary, it's going to be a closer primary than he's ever had before. Um, it may even, he released an internal poll that in my mind is a little bit questionable because it, it was it had a lot of 65 plus uh, polling in it, but uh, I, I, so I think it's definitely going to be closer than that, but I, I just don't see him losing that primary. Um, I, you know, could be wrong. Is it one of those cases, so that I, I believe there's five candidates in, the, in that primary, including mm -hmm. Congressman King. 
is it is that to his benefit and where it more maybe just to him and De well definitely I, yeah definitely to his benefit because he's he's as the incumbent he obviously has more you know hard hardened supporters but um but again going back to his internal poll he showed even you know he's about 50 percent so i'm not sure it, it it's going to matter that much i've been confident all year he's going to win that primary and i think he would beat any of those candidates one to one and it's going to be even easier for him to win with a splintered field of opposition but you have to remember that state senator randy feenstra who's like the republican establishment's choice in that primary has never had a contested election he's never had to beat an opponent in any in a primary or general and i don't think he has the political skills to beat steve king well, is it possible, Shane, that some of these people who are, the filing deadline in Iowa is March 13th, mm -hmm. so we've got time for people to get in or get out. Is it possible that some of these other candidates challenging Steve King would drop out of the race? Uh, maybe, uh, but I haven't seen that, you know, any indication from any of the candidates that I've talked with that they, you know, that they would, they would do that. I mean, Steve Reeder right now, he's... He's not really raising a lot of money. I mean, maybe he may, you know, he may drop out, but um, you know, I see Jeremy Taylor staying in. He's actually he seems to be racking up some endorsements and some long support. So, I want to point out to our viewers, remind them, it takes 35 percent of the vote to win a primary right. outright. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's why if the anti-King forces are splintered, it obviously. Uh, enable Steve King to get to 35 percent. So, and I gather that's what both of you feel is going to happen. I think right. he's going to. I think he would exceed 50 percent anyway. But yes, I just. I think the Republican base largely agrees with Steve King's opinions and views. And that, that's all, uh, although some Republican establishment figures wish that weren't true. It is true. Yeah, I, I would a caveat. I, I would say they agree with you know how he's voted. Uh, they may not necessarily agree with everything he says on Twitter. Just a few minutes, Dave. Go yeah, ahead. maybe we should turn just quickly to the legislative session coming up in January, starting there. Um, do you think, Shane, that, that conservatives have an expectation out of this session um, just simply because obviously there's some uh, concern about whether the House stays in Republican mm -hmm. control or not? So is there a feeling like this might be our last chance to really get something through that uh, conservatives may want to get through the legislative session? Yeah, I, um, I haven't necessarily heard anybody say, hey, this is, the, this is the top bill I want to see get pushed through, but I know there's concern among Republicans that, you know, the Iowa House is vulnerable. So, so uh, you know, I think definitely if there's any movement on, you know, any kind of property tax reform, you'll probably, you know, see at this session. Um, any movement on tax credits, you know, it, we'll see that as well, or school choice. Controversial uh, social issues? Uh, well, school I, choice I, would be. Well. well, I think there's more bipartisan appeal with school choice right. than, mm -hmm. than a lot of people would give it credit for. But um, uh, on the abortion issue, until, uh, you know, with right now where the courts are at, I, I think that they're only, the only bill they could really put forward is the constitutional amendment they they uh, um, introduced last year that basically wrote, you know, st and stated uh, that. I, know, I what never do you figured it. I don't know why they didn't pass the anti-abortion constitutional amendment, the state-level constitutional amendment mm -hmm. last year, and I find, found that intriguing. They didn't even pass it through the Senate, where they have a 32-18 majority, so I'm not quite sure what's going on there. And I think that maybe they sense that the public isn't really with them on that issue. Well, but I think during the legislative session, it'll be interesting to see whether the incoming speaker, Pat Grassley, uh, has he's said that he's going to try to find consensus in his caucus. I mean, there are a number of people in his caucus who weren't happy with the way Linda Upmeyer ran things, and we'll see how that goes. I mean, I'm very concerned that Mid-American Energy is going to make another big push for the solar bill that got stalled last year that didn't get through that. It's one of the issues that I'll be watching during the legislative session. Yeah, as far as, as, far as uh, the, you know, pro-life pro Republicans, I mean, they have a Republican majority, but I, I don't think everybody is as pro-life as, you know, in, in the Republican caucus as, you know, the Democrats would like to think that they are. So some bills that get through, some others, you know, are harder. Playing off of Dave's question, Republicans, particularly in the House, have to make a decision. Do they opt for a moderate, less controversial, you know, pass the budget and get out of Dodge approach? Or do groups say, we've got to have this bill, that bill, that bill, the social conservatives, this may be the end of our trifecta? Which is it, Shane? The, the, well, the skeptic in me is that they'll go the latter, they'll go moderate, and, and end up 
you know, angering their base, which that seems to be the Republican MO. Well, but are they, Laura, are they worried about angering suburban women? Well, they should be worried. If we, if we look at what happened in the Kentucky governor's race and the Louisiana governor's race and the Virginia legislative races, they should be worried about the suburban voters, and, and that's who the voters they'll need. I mean, I think one, one sleeper issue in the legislative session that I'm watching for is the gun constitutional amendment, which there was a screw-up by the Secretary of State's office, so it didn't get published before the 2018 election, and they had to start over. Over, but they may try to retroact retroactively fix that so they can get it on the 2020 ballot. Conversely, real quick, we talk about suburban women voters. Can Iowa Democrats, if they're going to take back the House, can they expand? The, so they won those. Can they expand into those mid-sized cities, rural areas, win enough seats to get a majority back? That's a big question. I mean, I'm looking at the overview of the House landscape. They There are paths to 51 House seats for Iowa Democrats. It would involve winning some of those seats or at least holding some of those seats in the more rural areas. And I think that one of the suburban seats, Ashley Henson's seat that she's vacating, is one that certainly they could win. But the one up in Winnesheet County, that they lost by nine votes when 29 votes weren't counted. That's another one. The seat down in Fairfield is one. And uh, Andy McKean holding on to that seat over in eastern Iowa. I mean, I think there are multiple paths. But there, some of those suburban seats might be difficult holds. The Republicans don't have declared candidates yet in some mm -hmm. of those districts, but we don't know yet whether they will have a, a strong contender there. Shane, quickly, what do you think? Well, I, I think definitely uh, Republicans have the opportunity to make some gains in, in the suburbs, as, as Laura mentioned. Um, so... Uh, I, you know, I don't. I, I. I think there's a good chance that Democrats could flip the House. I think a lot of it just really depends what happens at the top of the ticket. We've got just a few seconds left. I said you were both online journalists. I want your websites for our viewers. Shane, what's your website? Caffeinatedthoughts.com. Caffeinatedthoughts.com, like too much coffee. Yes. Right? Okay. <laughs> Laura. Bleedingheartland.com, and also there's a Bleeding Heartland Facebook page, and I'm on Twitter at Laura R. Bellin. Okay, great. Thank you both for being with us. And we'll be back next week for another edition of Iowa Press at our regular Friday night broadcast on IPTV's main channel at 7.30. And again, Saturday morning at 8.30 on IPTV's Dot3 World channel. And of course, anytime online at IPTV.org. For all of us here at Iowa Public Television, I'm David Yepsen, and thanks for joining us today. Funding for Iowa Press was provided by Friends, the Iowa Public Television Foundation, the Associated General Contractors of Iowa, the public's partner in building Iowa's highway, bridge, and municipal utility infrastructure. I'm a dad. I am a mom. I'm a kid. I'm a kid at heart. I'm a banker. I'm an Iowa banker. No matter who you are, there is an Iowa banker who is ready to help you get where you want to go. Iowa bankers, allowing you to discover the genuine difference of Iowa banks.